Impetigo is an acute, highly contagious, gram-positive bacterial infection involving the superficial layers of the epidermis. It occurs most commonly in children. However, a person at any age can get impetigo. Impetigo is caused primarily by two species of bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus, a gram-positive coccus arranged in clusters. And Streptococcus pyogenes, a gram-positive coccus arranged in chains. Impetigo may occur in two forms. One is bullous impetigo. And the other form is non-bullous impetigo, which is the more common type, accounting for about 70% of cases. Impetigo commonly occurs in warm, humid areas. In addition, poor personal hygiene, pre-existing cutaneous disease, and overcrowding may also promote development of impetigo. As I said before, it can occur at any age. But more common in children. Rapid spread of the disease and outbreaks occur in places where people gather in large numbers. Such as daycare centers, prisons, and among sportsmen. Non bullous impetigo, also known as impetigo contagiosa, is the more common form of impetigo. It usually affects the skin on the face and extremities disrupted by bites, cuts, abrasions, or any other trauma, and skin diseases like varicella and herpes. Non bullous type may be caused by Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus pyogenes, or both. Most infections begin as a streptococcal infection. However, Staphylococci replace Streptococci with time. This is because Staphylococcus aureus produce bacteriotoxins that are toxic to Streptococci. Methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA, is an increasingly common cause of impetigo. And these organisms are more frequently observed in non-bullous form than in bullous form. Unlike non-bullous form, bullous impetigo mainly affects intact skin. And it is caused almost exclusively by Staphylococcus aureus. It is a toxin-mediated infection, where the epidermal layer of skin sloughs off, resulting in larger areas of skin loss. There is another form of impetigo, which is more severe and less common, called ecthema. It is a much deeper, ulcerated infection, often occurring with lymphadenitis. Now let's discuss about the pathophysiology of impetigo. Intact skin is usually resistant to colonization or infection by pathogenic bacteria like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. However, disruption of its integrity may facilitate bacterial colonization or infection. Common mechanisms of skin disruption include scratching, insect bites, skin diseases like varicella and herpes, thermal burns, any kind of trauma, scabies, and pediculosis. Staphylococcus and Streptococcus contain a special molecule in their plasma membrane, called tachoic acid. In order to colonization or infection, this molecule should bind to the epithelial cell receptor, fibronectin on the host cells. However, these receptors are not available to bind on the intact skin. But, any kind of skin disruption may expose these receptors and facilitate bacterial growth. In addition to skin disruption, there are some other risk factors that may increase the likelihood of infection by these organisms. These include recent antibiotic treatment, because it may alter the normal skin flora, immunosuppression with corticosteroids, systemic diseases like diabetes mellitus, and HIV infection, dialysis, and intravenous drug abuse. Once these organisms bind to the host cells, they secrete enzymes such as proteases, lipases, coagulases, and hyaluronidases that damage host tissues. Once the infection is established, new lesions start to appear on the intact skin as well, marking the spread of the infection. Pathogenesis of bullous impetigo is somewhat different from above mechanism. It is mainly due to the exfoliative toxins of Staphylococcus aureus. These toxins cause loss of cell adhesions in the superficial dermis, which resulting in blistering of the skin, followed by sloughing off of the epidermis from stratum granulosum layer, as indicated in this picture. The main target protein of exfoliative toxins is desmoglane, which maintains cell-to-cell -cell adhesions. Exfoliative toxins also act as superantigens, which stimulate the immune system to a higher degree, and more importantly, activate T-lymphocytes, causing toxic shock syndrome. In contrast to non-bullous impetigo, the lesions of bullous impetigo usually appear on the intact skin. Now let's discuss about the signs and symptoms of impetigo. Patients with non-bullous impetigo may present with multiple lesions on their face, especially in the perioral and perinasal regions. And extremities. Palms and soles are spared. Although any other area of the body could be affected, these are the commonest areas. 
Non-bullous impetigo begins as a single erythematous macule that develops into a vesicle or a pustule less than 2 cm in size. These vesicles then rupture and discharge out serous contents onto the skin surface. When the serous content dry, they become honey-color crusts over the erosions, as indicated in this picture. If you elevate these crusts with your finger, you can see a moist erythematous base under the crust. When the lesions heal either spontaneously or with antibiotic treatment, these crusts slough off and heal without scarring, because only the epidermis is affected. The lesions in non-bullous impetigo are usually painless. Some patients may experience occasional pruritus. There is little or no surrounding edema. Regional lymphadenopathy is common in non-bullous impetigo. Patients with non-bullous impetigo usually report a history of minor trauma, insect bites, scabies, or any other type of skin disease. Streptococcal pharyngitis is absent in impetigo. Because pharyngitis and impetigo are caused by different strains of streptococcus pyogenes. Impetigo is due to pattern D strains. And pharyngitis is due to pattern A, B, and C strains. Bullous impetigo frequently affects neonates. But, it can affect older children and adults as well. Unlike non-bullous type, the lesions of bullous impetigo appear on intact skin. And these lesions are thin-roofed, flaccid, transparent bully less than 3 cm in size. And they contain a yellow color fluid. The bully can easily rupture, producing a rim of scale around a moist, erythematous base. The lesions of bullous impetigo usually develop on the skin of intertrigenous areas such as neck, axillary and crural folds, and diaper area. There is no surrounding edema in bullous impetigo. And regional lymphadenopathy is absent. Sometimes, bullous impetigo may involve the buccal mucosal membrane as well. And, bullous impetigo is considered less contagious than the non-bullous type. However, extensive lesions may be associated with systemic symptoms such as fever, malice, generalized weakness, and diarrhea. And rarely, some patients may present with pneumonia, osteomyelitis, and septic arthritis. Now let's see some common complications of impetigo. Some patients may experience pedal edema and hypertension in non-bullous impetigo. These are the signs of renal dysfunction caused by post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. In addition, transient proteinuria and hematuria may also present. These signs usually begin about 10 days after the lesions first appear. In addition to glomerulonephritis, some patients will have scarlet fever staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, osteomyelitis, cellulitis, septicemia, and septic arthritis. Diagnosis of impetigo is primarily based on the history and clinical appearance of the patient. And sometimes, bacterial culture is recommended to identify possible methicillin-resistant staphylococcus aureus in outbreaks. And if post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is present, the specimen isolated for culture in non-bullous impetigo is the fresh exudate underneath the honey crusts. And in bullous impetigo, it is the blister fluid. In microscopy, Staphylococcus aureus is seen as arranged in clusters. And Streptococcus pyogenes is seen as arranged in chains. Now let's discuss about the treatment of impetigo. Even without treatment, impetigo usually heals within two to three weeks of time. However, treatment produces a high cure rate and limits the spread of the disease. And rarely, untreated non-bullous impetigo may progress into ecthema. Treatment of impetigo involves local wound care and antibiotic therapy. Antibiotic therapy for impetigo may be with a topical agent alone or a combination of both systemic and topical agents. Removal of the honey-colored crusts and gentle cleansing with an antibacterial soap is essential before applying the topical agent. Topical antibiotic treatment is the treatment of choice for uncomplicated, localized impetigo. It eradicates isolated disease and limits person-to-person -person spread. Mupiracin ointment, also known as Bactrobin, is recommended as the first-line topical antibiotic by many clinicians. And Ritapamulin, also known as Altabax, is another option. It is relatively a new type of antibiotic and used to treat localized impetigo caused by streptococcus pyogenes and methicillin-susceptible staphylococcus aureus in children older than 9 months. It has an excellent spectrum over mupiracin. Fusidic acid is also used to treat impetigo. However, the use of fusidic acid has been declined due to the increasing antimicrobial resistance of staphylococcus and streptococcus. Systemic antibiotic treatment is recommended for infections that are widespread, complicated, and associated with systemic manifestations. 
Antibiotics used to treat impetigo should have gram-positive bacterial coverage. Beta-lactam is resistant antibiotics such as cephalosporins, augmentin, and oxycycline are used if methicillin-susceptible Staphylococcus aureus is suspected. Cephalexin appears to be the drug of choice for antimicrobial therapy in children. If MRSA is suspected, alternatives include clindamycin, trimethoprim, and doxycycline for patients older than 8 years. Empiric treatment for impetigo depends on the prevalence and sensitivities of MRSA in a particular geographic region. Clinicians should be aware of local resistant patterns. Erythromycin and clindamycin used as alternatives in patients with penicillin hypersensitivity. For patients with bullous impetigo involving larger areas of skin loss, intravenous fluid resuscitation may be needed because of the extensive dehydration. Inpatient care may be required for infants who are at risk of developing sepsis and dehydration. Finally, let's come to the prevention. To prevent spread of the disease, children should be advised to avoid close contact with other children and discourage patients touching the lesions and patients should be advised to maintain a good personal hygiene. For example, cut fingernails in short and frequent hand washing.